everybody, Chris White with the American Battlefield Trust, and we're here down in Mississippi, we're in Jackson, we're at the state capitol, and we're checking out our second video here inside of the Mississippi archives. Um, and this is going to be one of the coolest collections that we see, and this is going to be Confederate flags. We know that folks love to check out flags here um, on our channel, and we're going to see flags in various states. Um, we're going to see them whenever they're ready to be in a museum, which if you've checked out our earlier video, you've seen some of those flags mounted, like the second Mississippi flags that were captured at Gettysburg. But we're also going to check out some other flags, and in this video specifically, we're going to see uh, the process of going from what does a flag look like whenever it is taken by a museum collection or a curatorial collection and what's it going to look like at the end. So I'm going to bring in our friend Megan Bankston and she is going to tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here in Mississippi. Megan, first off, what do you do here as part of the museum? Hey Chris, glad to be here. I'm Megan Bankston. I'm the Curator of Collections and Exhibits for the Museum Division, which is part of the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. And I curate collections objects for exhibit, for temporary exhibit, traveling exhibit, and supplemental exhibiting. So, um, and part of that is digitizing the collection, which we might talk about a little bit later. Yeah, absolutely. I think di digitizing collections is very, very crucial, especially for historians and upcoming historians. It makes our lives a lot easier to be able to go onto Google and find places like this. Um, and she was telling me uh, earlier that you have your flag collection online, so it's accessible to actually for the public to, to check out online? Yes, it is. You can go to our website and find out our um, collections tab, and it has our historic objects collection. We only have about a thousand artifacts available online right now but we're working to incre increase that number every single day and uh, we'll get with you Chris and give you the link and make sure y'all know how to find it on our website. Yeah, and, and this is going to be a great way to engage with history, but we encourage you to come out to the museum, check out the museum complex out here in Jackson. If you're on your way to Vicksburg or from Vicksburg, you can come out here to Jackson, and there's a lot of Civil War history out here tied to the state capitol. So without further ado, let's check out a few of the flags. And like I said, we're going to go from what these look like now. These are not ready to be on display with the, the public, but they are uh, gonna go to a conservator who will take care of these flags and then eventually they will go into the collection and then maybe on display one day. So Megan, we have a bunch of drawers here yes. and I know there's really, really cool stuff inside of it. <laughs> what do we have for us? So we're gonna pull out drawer number nine. We have a silk flag that's been put onto a brown cotton backing. And this one is missing a lot of the canton. We don't um, have the information there, but we do um, have most of the flag put together and kind of stabilized on this backing. And then you see this clear film and that makes it easy for our uh, collection staff and our conservator who is on staff to roll it up so that hopefully we can eventually send it to a flag conservator in the future. And so, Megan, is, is this mylar that it's on, the, the clear yes. mylar? So that's mm -hmm. clear mylar, and this is all in a museum setting, so this is all professionally being taken care of. This flag itself, um, it's a representation of a silk flag? Yes, a silk flag here. Um, you can see the various condition of it. It definitely has been chewed by pests, the holes here, here, here. And then over time, silk just deteriorates and shatters. And so you start getting holes and tears along the entire surface. Yeah, one of the things we were discussing uh, was flag storage. Sometimes these flags would hang in a place that was in a very brightly lit area, like a museum. Maybe it would be in a library, a church, or some other place. Or others may have, as Megan pointed out, put it in a place that wasn't safe from, from mice or rats or uh, even insects. So over time, these flags will deteriorate. It's not necessarily battlefield damage. It's not necessarily somebody is trying to harm this flag. It's just they didn't store it properly or it's just mother nature taking over. Megan, what else do we have? In, Let's in here? show you another one. Drawer number 11. This is a larger silk flag, again, on that brown backing. And this was an early, probably, I'm going to guess, 1960s, 1970s effort at a con conservation. And you can see this one is really shattered, especially along the field. And the little pieces have just been kind of placed where they are matching. But a flag conservator can act like a puzzle piece 
person who wants to sit here and put these puzzles together. And so they will sit and piece together each little shattered bit and hopefully build the flag back into its one entirety. So that, that takes a lot more patience than I think I've ever had in my life. But if someone really enjoys that sort of work, there, there, there's your field you need to go into. Yeah, not me. <laughs> that, that is definitely not me, but I love to see what they come up with afterwards. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's interesting, Chris, if you could just take a step over here. One thing that we can tell is actually where the stars were. We can see that there were six pointed stars up here in the Canton, which is usually that blue field that we think about on flags. Um, so you might be able to see here. And, and Megan, a lot of times these silk flags are painted. Mm -hmm. They are, and a conservator might be able to look at the, if there are any paint residue on there and tell us what color those f stars used to be. That's really Even neat. though none of them are existing, they might be able to decipher what color it used to be at some point. So That's neat. It's almost like taking back the layers of, of history and taking away the, the dirt and everything and, and just kind of like, like an art conservator. Mm hmm all right, what else do we have in here? All right. We're going to go all the way down. So we have a wool type flag that's in very good condition compared to what you've seen today, but still with the holes. Um, like Chris said, we don't know if these holes are from the battlefield or if they're from later on, but then there is a possible war department number. It just says a three in the bottom that's been, I don't know if it's been chewed away or if it's deteriorated. It's kind of interesting how it's just missing, but you can tell there was a three there. And then up here, the pieces of paper have deteriorated and the cloth at the top. So that was recounting the history of the flag, but portions of that have been, have been lost. So. Um, that's part of the research that we do behind the scenes as collections managers, trying to figure out where these flags came from in their history. So the notation up here is that this is from the third, uh, May 3rd, 1863 at Chancellorsville, and it shows the 77th New York Infantry, which are known as the Bemis Heights Regiment, which harkens back to the uh, battlefield at Saratoga during the Revolutionary War. Um, and this flag is what is being claimed as one of the flags that would have been captured at the Second Battle of Fredericksburg. Um, this is not something that was actually planned uh, whenever they opened this drawer. This is uh, also showing the Second Division of the Sixth Army Corps. Chris and I actually wrote a book about this, so this potentially came from the 18th Mississippi Infantry, um, which is the only battle flag captured at the Second Battle of Fredericksburg. Um, so this could have been uh, Thomas Griffin's 18th Mississippi uh, flag that was captured in the Sunken Road at war as they were fleeing the sunken road at Fredericksburg. But the 77th uh, New York actually uh, attacks across an area where the Central Virginia Battlefield Trust, uh, who's Chris McCassie's on their board, where their, their office is today. So this, this up here is kind of sewn in, it's kind of uh, handwritten in ink. And then down here on top of this, we can see fueled, uh, looks like it says Field Quartermaster, 2nd Division, 6th Army Corps, um, and that's May 6th, and it's talking about the, the capture of this flag near Fredericksburg by the 77th New York. So this potentially could be that flag of the 18th Mississippi um, that was captured on May 3rd, 1863, in this famed sunken road. Um, over on this side, though, we have a different looking sort of flag. Yes, you, you have a flag that is in a total state of, I can't say disrepair because I've heard from our conservator who's an objects conservator on staff that a flag conservator could potentially figure out what this flag used to look like and put it back together. I would love to see that happen, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the funding is not there right now. So um, that would be something that would be truly amazing and remarkable um, that would take a lot of work. This is uh, just a, a portion of the collection because all of these drawers over here that are behind Chris um, are filled with flags in various st states and conditions. And I noticed here that this flag is definitely not a, a cotton flag or um, not a silk flag. So we would have some 
different materials uh, for these flags, such as? Yes, um, cotton and wool would definitely be more stable than the silk. The silk tends to deteriorate faster. It is more susceptible to temperature fluctuations and to being folded even. When you fold something, mm -hmm. it creates that stress line and it can start to tear or shatter along that line. So um, if you have any at home that you're trying to preserve, put tissue padding if you need to fold it in between each fold line. Um, try to use archival materials. You can find those online easily. But um, a cotton or a wool item is more sustainable yeah. in the long run. And, and, you know, a lot of these flags, when they're going on a march, the, the soldiers themselves would actually have rolled them up themselves. They wouldn't always have the battle flags flying. We see those in movies. We see them a lot of times. But we have evidence um, of these guys. Those flags are big. They, carry, they catch the wind. They're heavy to carry for a long time. So the color bearers or the flag bearer would a lot of times roll the flags up and then they would put a shuck over top of them or a, a, a sheath to protect them. And then when they would go into battle, they would take the shuck off and then they would unfurl the flag and that's when they would go in. So even the soldiers themselves who are uh, you know, putting these flags out into the elements, rain, snow, humidity, heat, battle, they're also rolling them up and, and taking them out. So they're doing some damage themselves, not, not thinking of it. And, and as Megan pointed out, there's, they're painting these flags so whenever you paint them, they look beautiful, but over time, as you roll them and unroll them, that paint's gonna start to crack, it's gonna start to flake. So they'll need to be repainted or repaired. And those things happen even during the Civil War. The famous story, the Irish Brigade at Fredericksburg not having their flags because they sent them back to Tiffany and Company in New York to have them restored uh, so that they could go off into action. So even the soldiers themselves would restore these flags. So they see a lot of action. Is there anything else, Megan, you would like to show us here in this collection or anything else you'd like to say about the collection? Okay, Chris, I think you bring up a good point about using the flags. Um, during the battles, you know, when they're carrying these flags, the silk is going to be lighter and it's going to be a lot easier for them to roll up and carry and pack away because you can roll silk tighter and pack it into a smaller area. But then when you are carrying a wool or a cotton flag, then that is going to stand up to the test of time and the battle that it, and the use that it's getting so and then you start adding on these tassels you can see a lot of tassels in this shattered flag this um the tassels are beautiful but they also weigh it down and so that's going to start to deteriorate the flag as well so that's just an interesting point about when you're constructing a flag and thinking about the different elements but we do have a couple of more flags that we're going to show you on these top drawers that chris is going to get on a ladder and and show you a little bit of those as well. So. Yeah, we'll check those out and uh, we'll be right back to you here on the American Battlefield Trust YouTube channel. So now what we're gonna do is go upstairs into the collection and we're gonna check out the next floor and the next stage of these flags. So we've seen them in this state where they need conservation. We're gonna see what they look like after they've gone to the conservator and are ready to go out on the museum floor. Not the droid I'm looking for. Now we've moved to a different part of the museum where we're actually checking out their collections. We're behind the scenes. These are not on display. This is special access for us. So we really want to thank our partners here. And what we're going to take a look at are those flags after they've been conserved and will be ready to go on display for um, uh, for the public to see. So we're bringing back on Shane. Kyle, Shane is over here. He's one of our uh, great contacts here at the museum. And what we want to do is take a look at this particular flag and we'll make our way through here and we might slide open and see what little surprises we have for you. But Shane, let's talk about this 44th Mississippi battle flag. It's in a, a strange state of repair, it would seem. Um, you know, what, where are we with this? This is a conserved flag? This is a, this is a conserved flag. So, uh, so I don't know, and your viewers may not be familiar with this, but oftentimes uh, when the department received a donation of a flag, uh, those flags come in in rough shape. They're oftentimes uh, in tatters, deteriorated. Oftentimes, oftentimes it's a ball of fragments. Uh, so what we do uh, before we can put things on display is obviously uh, try to elevate the status of that object as best we can uh, to preserve it for perpetuity and to make it and, and to put it out in a displayable form. Uh, so what you see here is a uh, Confederate Second National pattern flag. Um, this is a pattern of flag uh, that would have been adopted in May of 1863, replaces the First National, which we saw some varieties upstairs. Uh, it's also known as the Stainless Banner. As you can see here in the Canton, we have the, uh, the Standard Cross from the Army Northern Virginia Battle Flag, and then we have the 
this what would have been white at the time, a bright white uh, field. Uh, and across that you can see the capture information here. This particular example belonged to the 44th Mississippi Infantry uh, and was captured uh, by troops from the 12th Iowa uh, at the Battle of Brentwood Hills, a part of the Nashville campaign there on December 16, 1864. You'll also note here on this flag, and this is present on many flags in our collection, uh, this three-digit number here in black stencil paint, uh, that's a War Department inventory number. Uh, so many of these flags, when they're captured, uh, some are retained by individuals, some are retained by states, uh, but for the most part there is a general call uh, for flags captured on the field of battle uh, by federal troops in the field to be sent uh, to the predecessor of the Pentagon, the War Department. Uh, and in the post-war years these flags are essentially kept in uh, boxes stored in the basement of the War Department. And in the late uh, 19th century, very early part of the 20th century, there is a movement uh, to get these out of the War Department, I believe about 1905, uh, and start to return these to the states uh, from which they were captured. So, um, And you'll see flags here in our collection that that both have this number uh, indicating they were part of the War Department inventory and then those uh, which do not, which generally uh, uh, represented a flag that was either hidden by an individual and kept uh, or kept by an individual state and then displayed many times in a state museum uh, or archive uh, until it was returned here uh, to the state of Mississippi. But what you can see here on this flag uh, is just all this uh, conservation work that had to be done in order to make it presentable. You'll, so you'll see here in the Canton the change in the color where our conservator went through uh, and stitched an archival linen, uh, archival linen backer. And what this does is really stabilize this top layer of fabric on the flag and then the, uh, the off red color there and off blue and white there for the cross uh, sort of indicate what uh, the original concept construct of the flag, uh, flag would have been like. Uh, so, but, but we have an obvious difference there to the visitor so they know that obviously what they're seeing is not original material here where it has been recreated uh, for stabilization purposes. Uh, what's also unique about this is, is the mount itself. Uh, so we obviously have a very large flag and it's been preserved here underneath what we call museum glass. Uh, and this is glass that filters out almost 100% of UV light. Uh, and when we do that, we put them in these frames uh, here mounted in this way. It allows us to put them out on display here in the museum uh, for you all to come and see. And it gives us that protection uh, from, uh, from different spectrums of light that are harmful and would cause further de deterioration to the flag. So. Uh, really just a great, great way to get out these uh, very rare, very, very fragile uh, historic objects here. So, Yeah, and, and this would be the, um, this would have been a flag that was captured at the Battle of Nashville. This is December of 1864. This is the death knell really for the Confederate Army of Tennessee under John Bell Hood. Um, if you're, you're following along with our chronology, you know, William T. Sherman has made his march down towards the sea, towards Savannah at the same time. So he's about to go capture Savannah while John Bell Hood went in the opposite direction up into Middle Tennessee. And he fought at the Battle of Franklin in November of 64 and then fights at Nashville. So this is one of those flags that was captured. The Army of Tennessee, the Confederate Army of Tennessee, will continue to serve all the way up into the Carolinas campaign where they're basically uh, what's left of them is nothing more than a, a small division. Um, so this is kind of showing that death knell of it. Um, and as, as Shane pointed out, this would have been bright white at the time. This is the fly end. So one of the problems that you would have with a flag like this is it's white over here. It's right over here in the, the Canton. Uh, but if it's not very windy and this is a large flag, this actually would kind of drape together and almost look like a white surrender flag. So you'll find some, especially in the Army Northern, Northern Virginia, flags that will put a large red stripe later in the war down this end of the flag simply to show that it's not a surrender flag. That's one of their ways of adapting the flags throughout the American Civil War. Um, and, and what's really interesting is with the archival fabric behind it that Shane pointed out, it gives you that outline of this flag. So it goes all the way down to the fly end. We call this the fly end. The fly end is flapping in the breeze. Um, and then it goes all the way up here into two of the stars of this Confederate uh, stars and bars that would be inside of this canton here. So it's really interesting too. The 209 that the chain pointed out over in this corner about the War Department. In fact, one of the buildings in Washington still exists where they, where they kept a lot of these flags as well as 
um, you know, the Lincoln assassination evidence. It's called the Winder Building. It still exists. It's still a government building. It was the first fireproof building in Washington, D.C., completed in the 1840s. Um, in fact, the gentleman who, who created it, uh, Mr. Winder, his cousin is killed at the Battle of Cedar Mountain in August of 1862, Charles Winder. Um, so if you ever go down past the old Eisenhower building, the old executive office building right beside the White House, right across the streets of Winder Building, and that's in fact where they kept some of these flags. Um, and that's where they were in storage. Shane, we have another flag down here. This is more of the traditional looking Confederate battle flag um, that folks know about. Sure. Can you so tell this, us about this one? Sure, so this is uh, this is the flag from the 19th Mississippi Cavalry Battalion. Um, it's kind of on this uh, very unusual fabric here. Uh, very, very thin, but it has more of the traditional um, Army of Northern Virginia uh, pattern battle flag. Uh, and this is a flag that belonged to a unit associated with Forest Cavalry Command uh, and was captured by federal troops um, during the engagement at Bryce's Crossroads in 1864. Uh, but you can really see uh, this is a flag that's, I think, very representative of just the shape that the flags often arrived here uh, at the department. And you can just see the numerous uh, the the uh, tears, uh, different cracks in the fabric, um, but you know these are these are you know 150, 160 years old at this point. Um, so we're very very conscious uh, of how we handle these and really putting them in these conservation frames is really um, about the only way that we can get them out. You know, ensure that they're safe uh, and displayable for perpetuity. So yeah, and, and keep in mind one of the the things that happens these flags. It's not always battle damage that's going to. Uh, devastate them. It's just time. Sometimes it's how they were stored, where people stored these after the war. Some people may have crumpled them up and thrown them under a bed or have rolled them up and put them in some different areas. And, and their houses and not temperature controlled. So not necessarily is this going to be, you know, battle damage that you'll see here. It's just sometimes the wear and tear of time. And I think we have a few more here, Shane. Yeah, let's, uh, we'll, uh, this is the magic of the archive. We're going <laughs> to The magic of doors. rolling storage. So. Yeah. So this is how, if you've never been into an archival collection, this is just one of the ways that you're gonna save space. This is a very much, you wanna keep as much stuff here in these archives as you can in your curatorial storage. So you wanna make sure that you can uh, have movable uh, mm -hmm. inventory racks. Um, these are the cow fences here that, that you can hang them on. So it's a great way to store them in a safe manner, but also in a compact manner. So we can open them up, it's just like a closet space here. Um, so Shane, we have, a pretty cool looking one. It's a little better shape over here. It looks like yeah. another War Department capture. Another, another War Department capture. This is the flag of the 33rd Mississippi Infantry. Uh, again, this is uh, another captured second national, but this one uh, you get a little more sense uh, for just the original condition of the flag. Uh, so notice here we don't have that uh, off color, the, the changing color there from the, the red and white fabric. So uh, I would say over well over 90% uh, of the fabric of this flag is original. Uh, obviously you can see just the color change as Chris mentioned earlier, this would have been a bright white, you know, that, that, that stainless banner as it's known at the time. Uh, so we've sort of lost that to this very gray, uh, almost butternut uh, coloration. And then again, you can see, uh, and this is true for, for many, many flags in our collection, but just the, uh, the hand uh, stenciling here, uh, captured by the 26th Regiment uh, Wisconsin Volunteers at Peachtree Creek in Georgia. So part of the, part of the Atlanta campaign there in the summer of 1864. Uh, but just a very, very beautiful example of a Confederate second national captured uh, in the field by Union forces. So. Yeah, and the 26th Regiment of Wisconsin Volunteers, they are a German unit. Uh, they go off to war with the 11th Corps in the Army of the Potomac, and their first battle is at Chancellorsville, near land where it was preserved by the members of the American Battlefield Trust. Um, they're going to fight at Gettysburg. Things don't go well there for them either. And then they're eventually sent out west, and they serve with the 20th Corps Army of the Cumberland, which is a consolidation of two divisions of the 11th Corps and two divisions of the 12th Corps, which give us the 20th Corps under Mr. F.J. Hooker, as Robert E. Lee used to call him, Fighting Joe Hooker. Um, but this is the uh, battle at Peachtree Creek when Joe has just given up command of that 20th Corps. Um, but Peachtree Creek is uh, outside of Atlanta at the time today, basically. It's part of Atlanta. Unfortunately, there's only a little sliver of ground there at Peachtree Creek that you can go and visit. Um, but it was one of the key battles where John Bell Hood took over that Army of Tennessee. So we've seen kind of the takeover of uh, John Bell Hood uh, here on this flag in one of his first battles there in Atlanta at Peachtree Creek and then kind of his last battle there at Nashville where it's kind of the death knell. So in that 
basically six month span, John Bell Hood and his army of Tennessee will be fought out very quickly. Um, and over here is a really cool, um, uh, another War Department capture, 4th Mississippi, and you'll see on here their battle honors, um, some of the most famous battles. Donaldson, that refers to Fort Donaldson. Um, you have Vicksburg, Chickasaw Bayou. This is an area where the American Battlefield Trust is doing work. This is just north of Vicksburg. Um, up in the Walnut Hills section of the city, and this is the December battle that where William T. Sherman served, um, and things didn't go well for the Federals there. Port Gibson, Big Black River Bridge, and then of course Fort Henry, which would have gone along with Fort Donaldson. So this is a really, really uh, uh, cool flag here. Shane, I think you have one of your favorite flags um, hanging on one of these walls. Chris, if you can just pan and just yeah. see. This is just a, a, a small sampling. We've got Two more over here, and I'm gonna have Shane talk about his favorite one in a, in a moment. We got the third Mississippi here. This is cool. It tells us it's restored um, by the 9th Regiment of the Connecticut Volunteers in 1885. Uh, over here, we have the 41st Mississippi who served at Stones River, also called Murfreesboro by the Confederates, Perryville Missionary Ridge, uh, and of course, Chickamauga. So, this is just an awesome <laughs> display of flags. 48th Mississippi up here served on many of the eastern battlefields, including Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, for all you Gary Edelman fans at home. And then, of course, we have some other uh, flags along here. But, Shane, you said your favorite flag's down over in this section. Sure. So, uh, and this is a, this is a flag size-wise uh, in our Confederate uh, battle flag collection. This is one of our smaller flags. Uh, but this is a flag with a really unique story that ties... Uh, to my home state, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm an Illinois transplant here to Mississippi, uh, and this, this flag has both the Mississippi and an Illinois connection. So you see there, uh, Rankin Rifles, um, this refers to Rankin County, uh, which is uh, just uh, to the east of us here. Right now we're in Jackson, which is in Hines County. Uh, and this is a flag that would have been made by the, the Ladies of Brandon, Mississippi, which is a, a small town there in Rankin County, where I currently reside. Uh, and this is a flag that was presented in 1861 uh, to Company G of the 10th Mississippi, uh, right before they uh, disembarked for a uh, training center up north, um, uh, would have been near Grenada, Mississippi. Uh, and they take this flag with them by the time they go through the camp of instruction and they uh, are accepted into the Confederate forces in the field. Uh, the use of company flags has been abolished, so so this flag would not have been carried, um, or would not have been allowed to have been carried. You know, actually out on a staff um, on the field of battle, uh, as with many of the other flags that we've seen earlier. Uh, but this flag is still carried uh, by the by the uh, company commander there, uh, Captain Miller. Uh, his first name escapes me at the moment, but he carries this flag actually tucked inside his frock coat at the Battle of Shiloh with the 10th Mississippi. Uh, he's going to be mortally wounded on that day on April 7th, uh, my birthday, uh, April 7th, 1862. Uh, and a few hours later, uh, another captain from the 40th Illinois uh, with the last name of Hoskinson is actually out there uh, looking for intelligence, going through, uh, helping with recovery of the dead. And he finds this flag actually rolled up uh, inside the other officer's frock coat removes the flag and sends it home to his family as a souvenir. Uh, Captain Hoskinson was a member of the 40th Illinois Volunteers. So um, this flag then spends the next few decades with members of his family, and it's eventually returned here to Mississippi uh, by his daughter. Uh, and it's actually the, uh, the, the captain who succeeded Captain Miller in command of uh, Company G of the 10th actually receives this flag, uh, passes it on to another member uh, from the unit, and they actually donate it here uh, in the early, uh, in the early uh, 20th century uh, to the Department of Archives and History where it has been ever since. And again, you can see um, this is based on the first national. Um, you can see some portions of it here have been trimmed. Um, this would have been, again, with the blue canton and the red and white bars, uh, very, very heavily faded, but you can still clearly make out the lettering here, Rankin Rifles in our rights. So just a, a, just a very great example of an early, uh, you know, uh, locally made company flag presented to a unit going off into the field and one that has a really great connection to both Mississippi and the state of Illinois. So uh, definitely, definitely one of my favorite to objects here in the collection. So. Yeah, it is amazing to see because you have to get almost right up on an angle to, to tell where the, the white would have been here on the stripe that would go for peace and then up here for kind of go showing for warfare with the uh, red and then over here blue for friendship. You can actually see 
right there, how it would go out and just how faded it was. Um, you know, whenever it came to dyes and different things that they would use for these flags, wasn't always uh, across the board. And with uniforms, wasn't always the best uh, dye jobs that, that were always done. So that's an interesting one. When I saw it, um, I think Rankin Rifle is my father, or my grandfather-in-law calls himself the Rankin Rifle because he went to Rankin High School and played football for the Rankin, uh, he calls himself the Rankin, Rankin Rifle and also the Rankin Rocket because he was so fast. That was his story. So as soon as I saw this, I thought about my uh, grandfather-in-law. So a couple good connections there. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the Civil War, um, though he has Civil War ancestors. But these are just some of the flags we have here. We also notice, um, what I like to point out is, is we close up here, we see the different style stars. Not everything's uniformed here. We have uh, over on this flag, we have more what you think of as a traditional star, the five-pointed star. And over on this side for the seventh Mississippi, we have a six-pointed star. Um, we also have down here the Duncan Rifleman of Mississippi. And, you know, this is touched not with impunity, with a thistle there in the, in the center. I mean, every one of these stories was important. Some of them have 12 stars, some of them have nine stars, others have 11, 13, um, depending on who made them, when they made them, and, and things like that. So, you know, if you ever get a chance to uh, head down here to Jackson, Mississippi, we encourage you to come over here to their history museum. This is right here, basically, um, in the old state courthouse complex. It's right near the mm -hmm. old state courthouse. Um, which is a really cool building just down the street from us. We also have um, the Civil Rights Museum next door and, of course, the Mississippi State Museum here of history. And this is just a fantastic place to come and show, uh, um, to learn more about Mississippi history. Again, we're only about an hour from Vicksburg, so if you come down here for the Vicksburg campaign, this is part of it. This is part of Grant's inland push towards the east and then eventually doubles back to the west out towards Vicksburg. So Jackson, the battle that took place here in mid-May of 1863 with Chris Mikowski behind the camera has a book about. Um, you can learn more about, about that battle, but also come over to here. So I know there's other artifacts we wanna check out in this collection. We're gonna stop our flag video and maybe show you a few other uh, uh, interesting items dealing with clothing, as well as maybe some bullets and battlefield finds that we have here. So on behalf of the American Battlefield Trust, I'm Chris White. Shane Kyle, thank you so much for having us oh, here. Thank you. And bringing us through the collection. Chris Mikowski behind the camera. Thank you for watching. Please hit the subscribe button. Please uh, hit that bell notification. Check out uh, all of our partners. We're going to put all their information down in the description of this video so you can go follow them on Facebook as well as YouTube. Check out all their great uh, offerings that they have. And thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education.